we share a reading from the first chapter of Mark's Gospel. Jesus came from Nazareth, leaving home behind, and was baptised by John, proclaiming his faith. And the Spirit descended on him like a dove, acknowledging his call. And a voice came from heaven, recognising his ancestry. He was then driven into the wilderness to consider it all. But when John was arrested, Jesus returned to Galilee, assured of his purpose, to proclaim the good news, that this was the time of the fulfillment of God's very good adventure of love. So, the story begins again. I invite you to share with me our opening prayer. The Lenten story begins with baptism. And Jesus' baptism shows us that baptism is a bold declaration that we align ourselves with God's purposes. The Lenten story begins where heaven touches earth and the earth is opened to the heavens. Here, God is present to anoint and to reveal the Saviour to creation. The Lenten story begins with the knowledge that the Spirit of God is present even when all around it is wild and desolate. The Lenten story begins not with Jesus being freed from the wilderness, but with Jesus being driven further into the wilderness for 40 days. The Lenten story begins with Jesus in testing times displaying his faithfulness to God. And this in turn stirs us in our faithfulness to God. And so we ask Jesus Christ to be our light, to shine so that we can see the path ahead, so that we can follow in his footsteps resisting temptation and living life to the full. So we're reading from Genesis chapter 9, verses 8 to 17. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, As for me, I am establishing my covenant with you and your descendants after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds and the domestic animals, and every animal of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark. I establish my covenant with you, that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. God said, this is a sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the clouds and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant 
that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. In this, we hear God's word to us. Thanks be to God. The story of Noah's Ark is one of the first stories that children are told as they begin the journey of faith. And it's one of the most iconic stories. And I know that it's developed greater meaning for me when I read an article in about 2012, which was written by a marine archeologist. And the archeologist was saying there is very clear evidence of a catastrophic flood that occurred in the area of the Black Sea. Now the Black Sea uh, is, 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 is uh, an extension of, of the Mediterranean Sea these days. But apparently, before the end of the last ice age, it was a freshwater lake surrounded by farmland and within the, uh, what people would call the cradle of civilization. And during the ice age, there was ice uh, covering the globe um, for a, 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 a great part of, of, the, uh, of the higher latitudes uh, to a thickness of almost a kilometre high. At the end of that ice age, and, there's, and I'm not sure, the archaeologist is talking about 5,000 years before Christ, but some people uh, push that out closer to 10,000 years before Christ. At the end of that ice age, that enormous body of ice melted quite quickly into the sea. And what happened was a catastrophic rise in sea level. Now, for this farming community around the low-lying freshwater expanse that is now a part of the Black Sea, what they experienced was the inundation of a massive amount of water over the top of the, uh, of, of the mountains uh, uh, which, which formed the cradle. They experienced the flooding of the whole world as they knew it. And this archeologist has un uncovered uh, the signs of, uh, of, of uh, the villages and, and, and the life uh, that is actually preserved at the bottom of the Black Sea uh, because it is a, it's a very salty mass. All of a sudden, when I read that article, I started to see where such an important and foundational story has come from. And it is supported by the fact that in uh, other writings uh, from the ancient Near East, people talk about at the very early part of creation, there being an enormous inundation by water. People who are not participating in uh, the Judeo-Christian faith will often scoff at the idea of a great flood, of a great inundation which wiped out civilizations, which wiped out livestock and in which many thousands of people perished. It makes sense to me that something like that has indeed occurred and that there's indeed evidence of it. Not um, uh, the covering of the entire globe, um, but the inundation and flooding 
of the world as people knew it. Fascinating background. And into that uh, horrific experience, people were still able to find signs of promise. So let's take a moment to pray. Loving God, the sea ebbs and flows, but the sea remains the sea. You have promised that your love will endure, even though our experiences and emotions go up and down as life goes on. Thank you that out of your love, we come to life and that by your love we are sustained and that it is to your love that we are always called back. Amen. Interestingly, in Australia, it's often a lack of water that has a greater impact on our lives than an excess of water though we did just celebrate that very significant 10 years of, uh, of, of Toowoomba experiencing a, a terrible uh, excess of water. But I've asked um, uh, Miller and Nola Ellison uh, to come and uh, share with us today some of their experience. So we had a bit of a chat this week about what it was like for you uh, surviving drought. Can you share some of that with us? Could I just give some facts? A cow, uh, milk is 87% water. So every time a 1,000 litres of milk goes out the gate, 870 litres of water are being exported. Our cows averaged about 30 litres a day milk. And to sustain that, they would need to drink between 120 and 150 litres of water each day, and even during the dry period, which is the, when she's finished lactating, we like to give them two months to get, um, regenerate for the birth of the next calf and start lactating again, she'll still need 100 litres per day. That is amazing. I had no idea about that. Yes, yes. And another fact is, it's probably ironic that you've chosen a dairy farmer because dairy farmers get a paycheck, we used to call it the check, but it'd be electronic transfer now, on the 15th of every month. We knew that was coming. Right. And Nola, uh, you used to um, uh, do the books, and, and how else were, were you uh, involved with? Sure. I did the books, and... Um I also would go and help Miller over in the dairy if it was needed. Um, yeah, so that kind of, yeah, being on the farm, being with Miller and, and helping out and, yeah. Yeah, and so how often um, uh, did drought uh, affect, affect the farm? Um, we were reasonably fortunate. Well, we were fortunate because we had uh, a a reasonable size license for the Macquarie River to irrigate. But when the drought hit, and I guess we had one really big drought when we were in Dubbo, um, yeah, so, and that, that really affected us on the land um, for water because uh, our irrigation license was running low. We had used our allocation and uh, we still had to grow feed for the cows. We still had to have water for the cows to drink. Yeah. Yeah. And so does the did the amount of milk that you were able to produce go down? Yes, it would go down considerably. Um, but Miller was uh, fairly wise. Well, he was wise in he would not keep cows that were not producing very well. He would always um, concentrate on his top cows and keep them and make sure that they would go into calf so that we would have um, 
more progeny coming on. Yes. Yeah, that we knew that we would give us um, a, a good, reasonable amount of milk. Yes. Yes. And so, Miller, what what would happen around you in the, in in uh, uh, with your farming colleagues uh, during a big drought? Uh, communicate. It's important. Uh, by com uh, even our own kids in the family set up. I mean, so often stress, uh, you would know better than me, stress brings on relationship breakdowns. Mm -hmm. um, it's not an awareness we had, but it was something we did. We, we kept the kids informed and it's another set of eyes. They can talk to kids at school and come home with sometimes an, another idea. Why don't you do that, Dad? Yes. Um, yes. But they were aware of the importance of water. Um, but water too had some pluses, the lack of water. Yes. You get less bacteria when there's, when there's no water about. And mastitis uh, was nowhere near the problem it was during wet times. Right. Because water is a super highway for bacteria. Ah, okay, yes, yeah. yes, yes. In fact, probably the worst episode in, in my dairy and career was we had a, had a dry summer, a dry winter, and we had the wettest spring ever recorded. We even had clover and trefoils that were bloating the cattle, just walking outside the, 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 the shed. Right. There was so much growth, green growth. The dry cows uh, got a, a bacteria infection that wasn't susceptible to over-the-counter uh -huh. antibiotics. Yes. And I was a leader in the industry, and when you're a leader, you attract research and development people. So I was part of the pioneering of pre-dipping cows before you put the cups on them. Right. Yeah. Uh, it's a standard practice today, but when we first did it, the milk inspector, first time he saw it, he said, oh, you can't do that. Right. Because just a year or two before, Iodine products for cleaning dairy equipment had been taken away because iodine was getting into, into the, milk the milk supply. Yes. So, yeah. When you become a leader, you attract attention and, yeah, and you get everything from accolades to the tall poppy at the other end. Yeah, to criticism. Yes, yes. And um, did other farmers come to you uh, for uh, ad advice or... Um, a support during hard times? Frequently. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, <laughs> as I said again, um, because I, I, when, we, when we retired, we were the highest producing milk herd in Queensland. Right. So when you get there, you, as I said, you attract people's attention. And it wasn't, uh, I, I would go and, we used to have, um, we had a group called DAGS, I can't remember, Dairy Industry something. And we used to meet, make it once a month. We'd go on a bus trip to see somebody's farm or go somewhere that's, and we'd communicate that way. And then privately people would ring up and say, I'm building a new dairy, can I come and consult? I'm buying a new cow, oh, will you sell me some of your progeny? Mm -hmm. I can say, that when I started, is I bought a, my first stud cow when I was 19 years old, and when we sold the herd in 2006, there was still genetics from that wow. first animal. Right. Yes. Yeah. And then Nola, um, uh, Miller told me that uh, when when times were tough, uh, you used to give him some particular advice. Would you share that with us? Yeah, I would always just tell him to, to look, don't look back, look forward. Um, yeah, that there was always something around the corner to look forward to. Um, yeah, that there would always, yeah, we would be okay. Because yeah. mm. we hear a lot about um, uh, farmers who, who become um, very downcast and, and, and feel that it's a hopeless battle against the elements. Absolutely. Um, at one stage, when we were going through the drought, we had um, looked for assistance that you could apply for some subsidy on the farm. And at that stage, we had run out of hay 
and we had a locust plague and that just devastated our ryegrass paddocks. Um, and so we applied to have some assistance. And we, they, the um, uh, agricultural department, they sent out a, a man from the railway department. Now, what he would know, I don't know. I still don't know. Anyway, I just felt probably that was my most downtime. Yes. I felt it was a real invasion of privacy, almost like he wanted me to count the amount of cornflakes I put in my children's bowl. Mm. Um, he saw we share farmed and we had the dairy side and the people we share farmed with, they uh, grew hay and um, um, crops. And that he saw all this hay down in the paddock. Well, you don't need anything. You've got all that. Well, no, that's not ours. We actually have to buy that. Well, he, we just had a lot of trouble getting through to him that we had to buy it. It wasn't ours to have just because it was sitting in the paddock. And I felt that was a great invasion for us. So I just felt really vulnerable when yeah, he yes. came along. To but have thought, somebody yeah, who didn't understand. Had no, yes. no understanding at all yes. of what it was like to be on the farm. Yes. Yeah. And then you were telling me um, uh, about, uh, after it did rain, uh, a, another sort of uh, hardship came in the form of like a tsunami. Yeah, when the locusts arrived. You could actually see, if it was, you had to actually be there to see it. It was like a line across the, um, the paddock and they were just marching and eating this high ryegrass in front of us down to the stalks. There was absolutely nothing. So that was really hard too. And you could, you could just see it going down it as like they came wave, across, just, like a wave. Yeah, just like a wave, and they were eating the crop. Yes, yeah, yeah. 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 So, so how did you uh, look forward to the future uh, when you were suffering uh, drought and, and then uh, plagues of, of locusts and, uh, and, and other hardship? How did you look forward? You have to have hope. You, that's my message to here today. If you don't have hope, you don't have any. Dreams are intangible. Hope is tangible. If you can't see hope, go out and look for it. Walk right across the paddock till you find that first seed starting to germinate. Build a bridge if there's something in your way. Don't look backwards because it, you won't find hope behind you. Just keep looking ahead. Share it with others. We are a member of this congregation. We were members of congregations our whole married life. Talk to people that you, you, your church family. Share it with them. Somebody will find hope for you. It's there. You've just got, sometimes you've just got to go out and look for it. Go and look for it, yes. So, I mean, for... Uh, uh for the people coming out of that uh, vast uh, flood of, of, of in Noah's day, uh, their sign of hope was the rainbow, that the sun was shining again, that the ground was starting to dry out. You mentioned uh, looking for the, for, the, for the first grain that was starting to sprout. What have been other signs of hope uh, that you've uh, hung on to? Well, the other signs of hope were you'd have a new calf on the ground. That was quite exciting. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he only liked the girl ones. <laughs> but that, that was always a great, great sign of hope. Uh, and also, you know, you'd look in your garden and there'd be some fresh vegetables and you could pick or the flowers would be in your garden. That was always hope. Um, there was always something to look forward to. People to come for lunch, they would bring things for lunch to share or we would have things. Yeah, that, all that sort of thing is hope. Yes, yeah. and it's about having your eyes open for it, Absolutely, isn't it? Yes. absolutely. Yeah, looking yeah. for hope rather than being down. I always told Miller to, yeah, build a bridge and get over it, you know. <laughs> we'll, be right, we'll be okay. There's, yes. Yeah, yes. yeah, rather than... Um, been down about it, look up and yeah, 
There's always, there's always a promise. There's always tomorrow to look forward to. Mm. Mm. That's a great attitude. Anything that you would want to say to, to, to wrap up or a final word? Well, I've probably seen more sunrises than everybody else sitting here. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the time of day when, yeah, there could be clouds way out on the horizon when the sun comes up. That's hope. Um, together we hope. Mm -hmm. I would be nothing without Nola. And yeah, it, it, and we've got three children and we've got four grandchildren. That's all hope. That, there's the hope for the, the Allerton family of these grandchildren. I've got one 22-year-old grandson who's itching to get that Land Cruiser ute that you'll see me driving around here with. <laughs> so hope lives on. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing some of your rich life experience. Thank you. Thank you and thank you, congregation. Now, you will also have uh, received, uh, when you came in this morning, uh, a prayer journal. And uh, that prayer journal um, is for every person who is part of the life of Middle Ridge Uniting Church. something that we've been working for about six months within the church council is uh, how to move into a model of being church that thrives and, and has en energy for mission in the 21st century. And in order to uh, release energy for mission, it's very important to have a very clear owned vision of the congregation. And that means it's something that is not um, formed by a few people, but it is for, the vision is formed by the whole congregation. And so uh, we're asking people over these next five weeks to spend several occasions throughout the week um, in prayer and in discernment. The prayer journal has the first uh, few pages, about three pages, uh, are sort of some background and, uh, and some resources for you to use. And, uh, but then uh, uh, after that, uh, there's a page for each uh, week of, of, of the five weeks and asking you um, some questions that the, that the elders have developed giving you some uh, biblical references uh, to read and reflect on. Opposite each of the pages of material is a blank page for you to, uh, to journal on, uh, for you perhaps even to express yourself artistically. And, uh, to, and we're inviting every person, no matter what age um, and, and no matter how often they come to church, if you are part of... Uh, uh, of uh, the worshipping and mission life of uh, Middle Ridge, we ask you to participate in this um, over the next five weeks. Um, there's the capacity for the journal to be emailed to you if you'd rather have it by email, but Margaret has got um, uh, physical copies as well, which I think are a little bit easier to work with. And the idea is, is that we will come together um, for um, uh, an afternoon of discernment that will bring together the insights that you've developed through this time of prayer and listening and so that we can articulate uh, a vision for Middle Ridge uh, that will uh, lead us into mission and, uh, and which will be like an umbrella under which we operate uh, for the next few years. Um, the elders have worked with me in, in putting together uh, this journal and there was a lovely concept uh, that came uh, from um, Sharon Baker and, and she's come across it in her, in her leadership studies and it, it, it says that a process of, of focusing down like this is, um, is a natural part of the pattern of any organisation. And uh, the model has been described as like a breathing model, uh, focusing in, uh, being, taking time uh, to reflect, and like an inward breath, and then breathing out and, uh, and, and 
with that, with using the reflection and discernment that's happened, breathing out and moving into um, uh, in, into action, and that she, uh, it's, it's recognised that in the life of any organisation, but particularly in the life of, of a faith community, there's an ongoing process of focusing and action, and then after a period of time, sometimes three years, sometimes eight years, whenever it's required, then there's a breathing in again, focusing, and a breathing out again. So this is not a, a once and for all um, uh, process, it's an, it's an ongoing thing. And, uh, and we've discerned that we're at a time now of breathing in, refocusing, listening to God's call on us, on us for the next few years. If anybody wants to talk to me about it or wants to clarify anything with me, uh, let's have a chat after church under the portico. Let's do prayers of the people. Let us pray. We witness to you, O Christ, as you move out onto the road that leads from Galilee to Jerusalem. You who shine with light, turn willingly towards the shadows. Give us the courage, we pray, to move out beside you, to shift our allegiance from the things of this world towards you, the one who bears ultimate meaning. We ask for the capacity to place our feet in the footsteps you leave us, that our souls might be guided and our lives shaped by your way. Awaken us each morning so we can rise and travel beside you as your companions on the way. As we travel, May the beauty of creation soothe us, O Jesus. May horizons bend towards us. May streams restore us and love tend us. We ask for the strength to square our shoulders for this season and hope to grow in us so that even in the dark times of suffering, we will keep our eyes on the dawn. And let us conclude with the prayer that Jesus taught. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. And we take a moment to pray a blessing upon the devotional offerings that we make as part of our life as the church. Recognising uh, that uh, we, we are not gathering them uh, physically in a normal act of uh, offering that we're used to, that uh, most of us are, are making our offering um, through direct debit, but that also there's the capacity to, to leave your offering uh, on the table at the back as you, as you exit. And we also pray this blessing upon the offerings we make to Lent event in the coming weeks. Loving God, we have been awakened to your grace, shining around us in signs of hope, both great and small. Thankful for your faithful presence in all things, we make our offering. We give it to you as a symbol of our desire to walk the way of Christ. We ask you to bless it with your Holy Spirit, that it may be used to bring healing where there is brokenness, to bring comfort where there is chaos, 
and to bring justice in the place of need. Amen. We conclude singing a beautiful song of how God is at work in our world, bringing beauty in the place of brokenness. Let's stand and sing. Well, let us go from here, more at peace than when we came. Holding space open in our lives for practices of hope and renewal. And may the God who holds all things give us courage. The Christ inspire us to costly love and the Spirit Mark our way with light and grace. Amen.